All right, so it seems like a good amount of people have joined here, so I guess we'll just get started. Uh, so before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to just introduce uh, myself. My name is Arv Makati. I'm, I'm the president of the Internationalist Business Club here at New Jersey, um, also commonly referred to as IBCNJ, and I'm a New Jersey at uh, Monroe Township High School, located around 20 minutes out from the Princeton area. Um, and so in, in behalf of our partners and other affiliates, I'd like to welcome everyone here to our commercial management and manufacturing event here with Mr. Shell, who is the chief commercial officer and a member of the executive leadership team here at HP. Uh, however, a couple of things before we get started here, uh, should any of our members here today find yourself curious or unaware about anything we discuss throughout the duration of the event, please feel free to direct any of your questions to Jeremy Slayton in the chat will be leading our final Q&A session towards the end of the panel. Since some of our members have signed the member uh, media consent form as of right now, be sure to use the raise hand feature on Zoom so we can know that you would like to speak and allow you to ask your question. Um, also, for those of you who might be tuning in online, uh, the Internet Business Club or IBC is a national non-for-profit collection of business clubs consisting of emerging student leaders who all share the common goal of providing value to society IBC members have access to selective networking events, workshops, quarterly business forums, as well as exclusive opportunities that select partners across the country, as well as community initiatives. And so for more information, feel free to check out internatus.org. Uh, and so without further ado, let me allow our speaker, Mr. Shell, to introduce himself. All right, well, good evening to you guys. I think you're mainly on the East Coast. Uh, I'm on the West Coast, so it's only 4 p.m. Um, let me start introducing myself. You hear my accent. It's uh, German. I can't even hear it, um, but you will have to endure it. I'm sorry for that. Um, my kids, uh, you see them both here. They're both in college, but they really make fun of my accent. But this is as good as it gets. I don't think my English will get any better than this. Um, so as uh, Araf uh, told you, I'm, uh, I'm an employee of HP, uh, HP Inc. Um, and I have been with HP for just 23 years, a very long time. I actually started as an intern with HP in Germany and I left HP twice and I came twice back. So I spent some time uh, at P&G and uh, I also spent some time with Philips, uh, two companies that I value a lot, but I was always happy to go back to HP as well. Um, with HP, I've, uh, I've lived a little bit all over the world. Um, we, my wife and I, we, uh, our first real appointment in HP was actually based in Dubai. This was in 98. I guess most of you were not born then. Um, it was very exciting. Uh, in 98, Dubai was not really on the map. When I got the job offer, I actually asked the, the HP for 24 hours because I actually had to check where Dubai exactly was. I had no idea. Um, and then when I when I figured that out, uh, when we went on a preview trip, um, we I, we both accepted the job, basically. And so my, my wife came with me. Uh, we stayed eight years in Dubai. I was the fourth employee of HP in the Middle East. So this was a startup office within a large company. And uh, it was very exciting um, because, you know, as you can imagine, the, in the in the beginning, four employees, we had to do everything. When I left eight years later, we were, I think, close to 800 um, people. And it was amazing how that office had grown. Uh, from Dubai, uh, we moved to Australia. Uh, by then, we had two kids uh, and we lived in Sydney and I was managing the printing business for HP for a region which was called South Pacific. Um, South Pacific is basically... Australia, New Zealand, uh, and a couple of islands. Uh, not a lot of business there, but very nice to travel. Um, and then we, we moved, moved to Singapore. In Singapore, I was responsible for HP's consumer business in Asia and its inkjet printing franchise. Um, we did that for two years, the family and I. Then we moved to San Diego, um, where I did the exact same job, but for a different region. It wasn't Asia Pacific and Japan. It was what we called back then the Americas, which was North and South America. Did that job for two years, and then I moved back uh, to, to Singapore with the family, uh, became the COO of Asia, and then I left. I left uh, to Philips and uh, did two years there managing the lighting business of Philips in, in growth markets before I then in 2014 uh, moved back to HP. Uh, again, based in the US, so that's what you see with all the flags here. That's all the journeys that I did. Um, yeah, and we moved back then uh, in 2014, we moved to Palo Alto. Uh, this is where the headquarter of HP is. I managed for a bunch of years uh, HP's um, business for the Americas across printing and PCs. 
And then in 2015, November of 2015, I'm not sure if you guys know this, but Hewlett Packard actually separated into two companies, into HP Inc. And that's what I, where I am today. And another company called Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Um, and yeah, I continued in my role when we had that split in November uh, 2015. And in 2018, November of 2018, I took a new role in HP. I was responsible for the uh, 3D printing business and digital manufacturing business of HP. And a year later, I changed roles again, and I became the chief commercial officer of HP, where my team and I were responsible for all sales um, in, of the company. We also manage uh, the PL down to an owned operating profit level. We own category management, for those of you that uh, might know what that is. So we define the four piece of marketing, product, price, place, promotion. We are in charge of that globally. I'll talk a little bit more about that. That's what I'm doing today. Maybe going a little bit earlier into the career. Um, actually, I started working not in HP, okay? Not even my internship. My first job was with my dad's company. Um, you see it on the left there, Shell GmbH. Um, that was a distribution company for consumer electronics. And uh, my father uh, ran that company and it was a family business and it was actually quite cool to grow up in a family business. I guess a lot of the common sense and business that I have, I don't have it from HP or P&G or Philips. I have it from my dad. Okay, so a lot of time spent there. And I studied uh, with, a, with a, 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 a college in Germany. It's called ESB, Reutlingen. And the cool thing about this college is that you study two years in Germany and two years in a foreign country. And you actually study in the local language and you have to write a thesis in the local language as well. So I studied in France um, and there was in Reims in the Champagne, uh, which was really nice. Um, I studied there the first two years and then for my third and fourth year, uh, I moved back to, to Germany to finish, uh, to finish college there. During those studies, um, I had to do two internships of each six month co-ops. Um, the first one was uh, in France in Paris with a magazine, I was selling advertising space. Um, and uh, the second one was actually with HP, okay? And that was in, in Germany, which back then had the uh, European Marketing Center for printing. And so that's where I started. Um, I like to play the drums. I'm playing the drums since I'm six years old and I still play. Um, in particular during COVID, <laughs> it was very good to have a drum kit at home. Uh, when you do 12 to 13, sometimes 14 hours of Zoom calls, and I'm, I'm sure you guys had your fair share of Zoom calls as well in the last 12 months, but sometimes it's quite healthy to play the drums after a day like that. It triggers something else in my brain, so I enjoy that. And I love soccer. Um, always have, you know, the Germans, we only have really one sport, it is soccer. And so I grew up playing soccer. And uh, today, Saturday, I watch all the German soccer programs. So I was very happy that, that this call happened my afternoon, not my morning, because I would have been busy. Um, that's me uh, as an introduction, Araf. I hope that works. Yeah, that sounds really intriguing. And we'd be happy to dive into some of those individual components. Uh, as we get into some of the uh, questions we prepared, I'd like to pass it off to uh, Zane Tohel, who kind of conduct that here. Cool. Yeah, thank you, Arav, and thank you, Mr. Shell. Like he said, I am Zane Sohel. I'm the Director of Strategic Initiatives at IBC New Jersey. And yeah, we'll hop straight into the questions. So the first one, who has been the largest inspiration in your life thus far and how have they impacted your position today? Um, look, it, it's, it's not really one person. Um, I'll, I'll stick to my parents, um, but I, I want to mention both of them because they both had a different part of influence. As I said, my dad was was the entrepreneur in the family and had a, a very early on a, a really positive impact in me instilling a certain sense of entrepreneurship in my in myself but teaching me business okay teaching me business hands-on um how to how to pick products in distribution that we wanted to represent uh, was a very early on a very important lesson you know if you have choice of products that you want to distribute you need to have actually quite a strategy to figure out which brand do you prefer over another brand? And uh, so very early on, uh, learning about quality of products, um, margins, um, supply chain impacts uh, that, that are important for the business, that was, that was really important. And my dad, until today, is, a, is somebody that I, that I you know, have a lot of discussions about business, um, even though he's retired. Um, he's uh, still selling a little bit. He's selling on eBay. Um, you know, he's 76 years old. The other day, he told me that uh, he had recognized that if he uh, 
advertises his eBay pages on Twitter that the traffic to eBay increases. I thought it was a phenomenal uh, insight <laughs> for a 76 year old guy. Uh, so he's doing well. And the other influence is my mom. Uh, my mom, absolutely no business uh, background whatsoever. My mom was an artist. Uh, she was a painter. And uh, I think you see a little bit the, um, the uh, complementary of the two parents uh, in, in my upbringing. Uh, so mom was responsible more for the creative side. And uh, she was the one that, that uh, pushed me for, for music and uh, made sure that I'm, I'm going to practice uh, playing the drums one hour a day uh, since I'm six years old. So I'm actually quite a good drummer just because of that. I wanted to drop it a couple of times, but I wasn't allowed. Uh, but she was a really creative person. And uh, unfortunately, she passed away. But uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, if you ask me, who are the people that really impacted me, these are the people. And then, you know, of course, along the way, you meet people in business, uh, you meet people in all, the, all these different places that we live in, that had a deep cultural impact. Um, but it was actually the cultural impact was Actually, I think coming from the fact that we as a family, we kept on traveling and we're now in the US and it's probably the longest we've been anywhere, but you've seen all the different countries that we've lived before and that has just a very deep impact. Just living in these, in these countries, you open up your horizon and you open up your mind a little bit. Yeah, thank you. That was amazing. So our next question is, could you explain just your story of how you became Chief Commercial Officer at HP? So what previous positions you went through, just basically the steps you went through to get to where you are today? Well, look, I think I explained it a little bit, but uh, I'll explain you two things. I'll go through again all the positions I had, but then also why we actually created that job, because I'm the first chief commercial officer of HP, and I think that that's actually interesting. Why did we create that role? So firstly, I think, you know, I grew up in HP um, at a country level. Um, so I had different jobs in countries, various countries, and then at some point, I moved up to managing a cluster of countries. Um, the first cluster of countries I managed was in the Middle East. And then HP sort of added to my territory. You know, at the beginning, uh, it was Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, the United Arab Emirates, Oman, Qatar. And then Russia got added. Uh, and at some point, uh, Kazakhstan got added. And then Turkey and Greece got added. And at some point, the continent of Africa got added. So it became bigger from a geographical point of view. It became more complex it became culturally uh, a little bit more diverse um, and different, different places have different uh, challenges. Um, currency uh, is a very big topic in some of these, uh, in some of these countries. Um, logistics is a very big uh, topic in some of these uh, countries. And so learning about this one layer uh, after the other was actually quite useful to, to be able to build on this. Um, I then, you know, I took over um, general management positions for the first time in Dubai, and then did that also in Australia. And when I then went to a regional level, this is when I got promoted to VP. Um, and I did that for a bunch of years. And then when I moved to, uh, to Philips, actually, I had such a large region underneath me that it was again a promotion from VP to EVP, Executive Vice President. And I think if you look at my, my upbringing in a company, there was also always the duality of product management and sales, the two together, okay? And in product management, as I said, you manage these, you manage really these four pieces of marketing. You go a little bit into category management. You understand not just your portfolio, but the portfolio of your competition. You have different routes to market. You can sell direct, you can sell digitally, you can sell through a marketplace, you can sell through brick and mortar, you can sell through distribution. You can sell business as a transaction where you buy a notebook, or you can buy it as a contract, as a subscription, okay, where you use a technology and you pay for using it, but you actually don't own the hardware. So we can talk about this later on. So, but different business models require different sales types, where you require different, um, yeah, different experiences. Um, and yeah, so then I just kept on growing, I guess, okay, in the career. And uh, my, my content hasn't really changed. I think the big change for me is the amount of people management uh, that, that, uh, that just you know got layered on uh, in my team today. We have, I think it's roughly twenty five thousand people. Okay, maybe twenty six, uh, but uh, it's it's a massive team, and so a lot of my day is actually spent managing people, uh, making sure that we're well structured, making sure that they're trained, making sure that we 
take care of an issue that an employee might have in order to make her or him more productive. That has become a major part of what I'm doing. And obviously there's still product management and category management. There's still sales as well, but that people component uh, has become a big deal. And now because I'm in the executive leadership team of HP, I think the fourth component of what I do is um, there's a lot of executive leadership topics uh, that we manage together. There's compliance in there. There's certain committees that I that I'm part of that don't necessarily have something to do with category management or uh, or sales. But these could be topics such as strategy, for example. Where should we invest next? Um, do we have any plans for merchant acquisitions? Uh, any acquisitions we want to do? Topics like that. So it gets broader. Okay. So I hope that helps you. Now, why did we create a role? Um, I actually think this is interesting. As I told you, you know, I grew up in HP. Uh, left twice, came back twice. And there was a lot of change in HP. I told you that the company got split in 2015. But one thing actually never changed in HP in all of these 23 years that I was associated with it. And that is how sales were structured. We always had three regions. Uh, there was the Americas, North and South America. There was Europe, Middle East and Africa, the second region. And then the third region was Asia Pacific and Japan. And these three regions, they had regional presidents, and these presidents were actually quite powerful. They decided what we will sell in a region, at what price, uh, when we will launch the product, how we will position the product. And this worked for us for many, many years. Um, but in 2019, I think we have reached a point where the digital go-to-market had taken over such a big part of our business that this decentralized decision-taking actually didn't work anymore. I'll give you an example. In the past, if one of our sales employees wanted to sell something, let's say in Portugal, um, that sale could be positioned very much in a Portuguese context, okay? And it didn't have any fallout because it was targeted at one route to market in, in Portugal. Today, uh, and actually already a couple of years ago, when that sale is transacted or done in Portugal, it can actually influence pricing and product value proposition all over the world. Because if it's a digital sale and an algorithm can pick up the, the sale in itself, then it will have an impact on how the same product might be sold in China, how the same product might be sold in the US. This is what happens in online go-to markets in marketplaces, 3P, we can talk about that later on, I'm not sure if you know what that is. But, uh, it basically instilled the need for us to rethink our decentralized structure into three regions. And that's that's the, the task I got, okay? I was actually in 3D printing at the time, but uh, I was asked to have a look into this and uh, came up with a structure that was very different. And that's what we call the commercial organization now in HP. This commercial organization uh, doesn't have regions. It has 10 markets. And these 10 markets report um, into a central organization so I have managing directors for North America, managing director for Latin America, a managing director for greater China, and so on. Um, we have a category, uh, one for, for each business that we have. And these categories are actually not in country. They are managed centrally. The people might be in country, but the decision taking is done centrally. Why? Because we want consistency, consistency on value proposition that we have to customers, regardless if they are in Portugal or elsewhere. And then we have centers of excellence. And in the centers of excellence, it's actually becoming super important for us. I talked already a little bit about algorithms. I talked a bit about marketplaces. There's a lot of data analytics that is involved in go-to-market today. So I have a lot of data scientists in our team. Uh, they manage in particular pricing as well uh, in making sure that we have the right elasticity, but also the right consistency of pricing, depending on what product we sell. And we also, we also changed the business model. We are not just transacting on, on technology, we're selling technology as a service. So you might have heard about this. I mean, one of them, I'll just give you one example, is a product called Instant Ink. Uh, it's, a, it's a replenishment service. If you have an HP printer uh, and you are uh, connected to Instant Ink, you can pay $2.99, $4.99, $9.99 a month, and you get a, an amount of pages for that subscription. When your cartridges, when the fill level of the cartridges is at 20, 25%, the cloud will automatically inform HP and we will replenish uh, the cartridges to be sent to your home. 
the objective is for you to never run out of ink, okay, uh, to always be able to print in, an, in a subscription model. And I think, you know, in particular during the pandemic year, when it was all a little bit more difficult for us to go shopping, this service uh, was really hip, is actually still hip. Um, we saw a lot of growth. Um, so I hope that explains a little bit what I'm doing, how I got there, but also why we actually created uh, this chief commercial officer team. Yeah, thank you. I actually did not know that was in your position. That was great to hear. So our next question. So could you talk a little more about what you do? And I think this is a little bit redundant. So um, I think we could skip this one because you kind of just already answered this. Yeah, so, I think we're through it. <laughs> yep. So question four, um, as a member of the C-suite as a large tech firm, what does your day-to-day -day look like? And how do you balance your professional life with your social life and family life? <laughs> yeah, uh, the last one is, is sometimes uh, very important actually being able to do the to do. Look, I, I think for me, it's very important that I actually um, make decisions of how my day looks like. If I'm not careful, others can decide what my day looks like. And I think this is this is dangerous. Okay. For me, in my in my role, I need to be able to define my day because it has such a big impact on the team. The way I structure my day is how 25,000 people potentially have to structure their day, okay? So for me, number one is um, it's very easy to get very internally focused in a company the size of HP, okay? We have so many employees, so much business, uh, so many internal topics, challenges, opportunities that you can actually spend your day weeks on end just looking internally at things. I'm in sales. Um, that's not good. Okay, if you do that. So for me, I make it a point to speak with customers and partners every day. And it's very important for me that my team uh, does the same thing. I want them to be externally focused. I want them to understand what's happening in the market. And I want them to understand what customers want. That has changed dramatically how you do that in the 23 years that I'm in HP. It's not in order for me to, to you know, in the past to understand what a customer want, wants, I need to speak to, I need to speak to them. And I still need to speak to them today. But there's actually a lot of information that I can get from data. Uh, data that customers provide if they opt in with us that we can analyze and we can predict uh, what this customer might be missing in a service, what this customer might be interested in buying uh, going forward. So a very big part of my team and my job and every day is to make sure that I spend enough time with customers and enough time with customer data. And bringing the two together is super important. I don't believe that data analytics can ever take over the direct touch with the customer. But I also think that companies that only have direct touch and don't have data and trends, um, they won't be very meaningful. So that, that's a big part of the, of the day. The second big part is to make sure that I understand what, uh, what my team needs uh, in order to become more effective and also more efficient. Um, that can be anything. Uh, that can be understanding if they have the right tools and the right processes and how they work. Um, if they have the right skill set, can I train them uh, and to make them better? Can I help them uh, by bringing in external knowledge to the company, either through hiring or uh, through services that we can uh, source externally. That is a big part uh, of the business. Then it's the whole interaction with other functions in the company, you know, um, HR, finance, legal, um, our global business units that build the products and define the, the, the product strategy. That's another big part of the business. And so then uh, I, I also try then obviously every day to spend some private time, spend some social time. Um, I've, told you I'm playing the drums so I make it a point to play the drums every day and if it's just half an hour but it's it's something that I do for myself and it helps me to to disconnect um, I'm cycling I love to cycle I like to swim as well so whenever I have time I, I'll do a little bit of sports um, so having the right balance of things is, is really important and for me to be honest the last 12 months yes I've missed the interaction with the team I've missed the interaction with customers and partners but on the other hand side, I wasn't jet lagged uh, for an entire year. That has never happened before in those 23 years, because usually I travel 60, 70 percent of the time, uh, not during the COVID year. And actually, I really enjoy that. So for me, looking forward, 
will be very interesting to see how much traveling I will do. I actually think it will be a lot less because I've learned that uh, I can work certain processes in particular internal topics without traveling. And I want to hold on to that. Thank you. So our last prepared question for now. So what advice would you have for a group of high schoolers like us trying to go into the business world? <laughs> Look, so I was, um, I was a high schooler once. Um, and uh, I had to answer a question when I was 17 year old um, to my dad. Uh, he had a health issue and he asked me, Christoph, do you want to run the company? Do you want to take the company over? I mean, go and study. But when you're done with studying, do you want to take the company over or not? And I told him, I don't want to take the company over. And the reason was that I had a very clear idea of what I wanted to accomplish. And the idea was not about becoming <laughs> commercial officer. Okay, that was not the idea. The idea was to pick a job where I would be able to travel the world and to live in different places. That was my number one objective. Okay, when I was 17, 18, that's what I wanted to do. And I think what, what helped me dramatically is that I had this clear objective. This was for me, number one. And then I could make a plan on how to go after it. And there's this little saying uh, that one of my managers has used in the past. I'll give it to you because I think it really resonates in hindsight with me. I did it uh, subconsciously, but uh, it, it really resonates. And it is uh, plan your work, work your plan, and your plan will work. Um, and I, I really believe that there is a real intentional um, theme across my career. I didn't do any move just out of, you know, out of, of coincidence. I always tried in my moves to get closer to my objective, to get to know the world, to learn, live in different places. Um, and that worked out, you know, and I, even in my private life, I tell you what attracted me to my wife, we're still married and we, uh, we studied in the same uh, program, but it attracted me was that my wife had grown up. She was born in Africa, grew up in Latin America and actually in New Jersey in Chatham. Um, so um, what attracted me was this, the fact that she was very international. I grew up for eight, the first 18 years of my life in a little village in the south of Germany. I was very much intrigued by, by her experience. And so that all came together. And again, it was done subconsciously, uh, but somehow there was a plan and I worked that plan. And so this is, this is what led to it. So very happy with the objective. I'm very happy with the fact that I was able to grow to, to, uh, to an executive leadership position, but that's actually, that's the byproduct. Um, that's the outcome, I guess. The real only objective I had was to travel the world and to live in different places. And the other thing just happened. Great, thank you. So like I said, that was our last prepared question. So I'll be handling, handing it over to Jeremy to handle the audience Q&A. All right, thank you so much, Zane. And so uh, hi, everybody, my name is Jeremy Clayton. I am a junior at the Burton County Academy in the Academy for Business and Finance and the Vice President of IBC New Jersey. To echo everybody else, thank you so much uh, to Mr. Shell as well as all of our members for coming out today. Um, so I will be running the audience Q&A session today. As a reminder, for those of you who filled out the media consent form, you are welcome to raise your hand and then we will call on you to unmute and then you will be able to ask your question. Uh, if you did not fill out the form, please feel free to message me any questions that you have in the chat and I will ask them to Mr. Shell. All right, so let's begin here. Um, Okay, so does anybody uh, have any question to, uh, again, feel free to raise your hand. I see Ishan just raised his hand. Uh, so you're welcome to unmute and ask your question. Hi, Mr. Shell. Um, I had a question just about something you had mentioned earlier about how you had sort of a plan of advancing your career. So I just wanted to ask what you think you were doing right that helped advance your career with regard to HP? Like, um, were, were you increasing sales? Were you improving relationships with executives? Or did you have a different plan that helped inspire HP to continue growing the regions that you managed? Look, I mean, in sales, um, it's, it's very quantifiable. <laughs> okay, so how much do you sell? Um, what, what's the margin uh, that you make? That's a short-term thing. But in sales, there's also a lot of strategy. You know, what, how do you cover a market? 
how successful are you in implementing different business models? Um, and then within the business models, what's the loyalty that you get back from a customer? You know, to keep a customer is so much more meaningful and cheaper to a company than to always hunt for new customers, okay? So what is the, the breakdown of what we call farming, which is managing existing customers versus hunting, which is going after new business, new customers. So that was always a big thing. Um, again, that's when I was a single contributor, okay? But then when you go into management, um, it changes, okay? That's still important. And you need to manage your team to have productivity and show productivity increases. But other things become important. Um, how happy is your team with you? Um, if the team, when the team gives feedback, gives feedback, what do they say about you? How are you able to work on your areas for improvement? Um, how do you, uh, how do you uh, be humble and, and, and basically uh, acknowledge that uh, there are areas for improvement and that you proactively try and address them. Uh, seeking help is something that uh, that was, was very important for me. Uh, having mentors in my life uh, that were within the company or outside the company was always something that I that I embraced. And I also think that what helped me is that when, when things got really stressful, I remember one time I was in Dubai, the region had become really big and we had two little kids and uh, I was on the road all the time. I was never at home. At some point, my wife sat me down and said, Christoph, stop, okay? Uh, we, have to, we have to do this differently. And I went to HP and I said, listen, guys, I, I really like the company. I like my job, but it doesn't, it doesn't work right now with the family. Uh, the kids are too small. I need to be a little bit more at home. And we agreed that the best thing would be for me not to try and do the same job, but to actually change the job. And this is when I, when I moved to Australia. So also, you know, being able to... to give honest feedback to your employer uh, in a organized fashion, in a non-emotional fashion, but really telling them what is important to you has worked with me in my career. So um, yeah, look, I, you will, when you, when you start your careers, guys, you will have no shortage of being measured. Okay. Every company measures you in particular, since you're all studying in the U S I think you might start working for U S based companies your generation is even easier to measure than mine because the data, the footprints that you leave, <laughs> they make it so easy to trace. Don't, don't be worried about this. Um, you, will, you will be able to very quickly figure out what is important to your employer, what are the scorecards, how you're going to be measured. And then you can obviously uh, go after that. But I think it's, it's more important to look at the total package of, of your life. Okay, How is your uh, business life doing? based on the scorecards, how is your business life going uh, relative to the relationships that you're able to foster with peers, with employees, but also with your external ecosystem of customers, partners. That is a very important piece. And then thirdly, how's your private life doing? Okay, how, how is that evolving? Are you happy in your private life? Um, do you like what you're doing when you're not working? Do you have ambitions in your private life that you wanna bring forward? At the end of the day, it's all these three things together and that will make you successful. I really think that if it's just one or two, then you will not be successful. I really believe in this, um, in this uh, consistent, uh, consistent need uh, to have all aspects of your life progressing in order for you to be a, a really successful per person, whether that's from a business point of view or from a private life point of view. I hope that answers your question, Ishan, but it's, uh, it's actually a very complex question, okay? I could have told you, yes, I made my quota every half year. Okay, okay, yeah, but that, that's not really it, <laughs> okay? All right, thank you. That was really insightful. Um, we actually did get a question in the chat. Uh, Lisbeth asked, do you think working in different countries has strengthened you as a worker and as a person? Yes. Yes. As a person, definitely, um, because you have to adapt. Uh, when you move into a country, um, and you know, I've, I've lived in very different countries, the culture in these countries is so strong that you need to arrange yourself with the culture of the country. Again, from a business culture point of view, but also from a private life culture point of view. And it does require you to, to really reflect uh, before you do something. It requires you to listen a lot, 
stop talking so much, listen a little bit more, particularly in the beginning, and try and understand what's happening, okay? And uh, yeah, I, I think it has strengthened me as a person, has strengthened me as a, as a, as a manager as well. I, I can tell you that my style, there are obviously certain principles in my management style that will always be the same, but my style do change. Uh, or does change uh, relative to where I am, okay? I think I had a different style when I was in Singapore uh, than I was, uh, than I had in Dubai or that I have right now. You need to adapt uh, without, uh, without sacrificing some absolutely must-haves, okay? And so from an integrity point of view, for example, there are certain things that you always take with you and that you are not willing to change. Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, I, I wouldn't miss wouldn't want to miss these experiences because they've made me to the person that I am. Um, and I think it would have been very difficult to get to that same understanding had I not moved around. All right, very interesting. Uh, so right now at this time, we wanna give the opportunity if anybody uh, who had signed the media consent form wanna raise their hand, I see Tiffany just raised their hand. So uh, you are able to unmute and ask a question. Hi. Um what was the interview process for becoming the CEO at HP? <laughs> um, yeah, it wasn't actually a formal process, to be honest with you. Um, I had, as I told you, I was asked by the CEO to look into that consistency challenge that I was talking about, you know, because we had these three decentralized regions. So it was a project. And um, I actually went back uh, after working on it for like four, four weeks, six weeks, maybe. And I had a meeting with my uh, CEO, uh, but also with the board of the company. And I presented uh, what I thought needed to be done. It's pretty much what I told you. Let's go from three regions to 10 markets. Um, let's have categories uh, that are central and let's have central excellence. I remember that presentation and then I actually thought, okay, I'm done. I'll go back to my 3D printing business now, which I love. Okay. Um, and we can talk maybe a little bit more about 3D printing and digital manufacturing in a second, but um, that is not what happened. Uh, what happened was, hey, Christoph, great presentation, great idea. How about you manage it? How about you lead it? Okay. That was the interview process. <laughs> so <laughs> it was, I was working on a project and then the project became my job. Um, that can happen, guys. Uh, not every, not every job gets, selected based on interviews okay uh, sometimes you grow into a role um, that has happened to me before and i know many people that that has happened to as well but all right that's obviously, that's obviously once you are in a company it's a little bit more difficult when you try and get into it then usually it's a it's an interview process okay uh, we actually, uh, before we continue uh, getting questions from the audience, we did get a question from the chat. Um, so Rachel asked, how is working at HP different from any other companies uh, you have worked with? Yeah, it's, very, it's a very good question. Uh, you probably observed that I left twice and came twice back. Um, and I went back because I always appreciated HP. Um, HP was created, I'm not sure if you guys know this, but HP was created um, 19, in the, around 1940, okay? And uh, it was created by two Stanford graduates. Um, and the first product that the company had, which was actually developed in a garage here in Palo Alto, was a product for Walt Disney. Uh, it was the voice, the oscillograph of the voice that... Uh, that Mickey Mouse is using uh, in some of these uh, black and white cartoons. I'm not sure if you've seen them, but if you hear that voice, that voice would not have happened without the HP product. And so as a matter of fact, <clears throat> HP is the very first company of Silicon Valley. Um, there was no other tech company here before, um, before HP. That always fascinated me. And these two founders, um, they stayed in the company um, until they pretty much until they passed away. And even when they didn't have an executive role anymore, they were still here. Uh, and they lived in, 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 the, in the Silicon Valley and they had a huge influence. And these guys created something that um, really resonates until today. And it's probably the reason why I like working for HP so much. It's a thing called the HP way. 
okay it's a it's a culture uh, that we have in hp and there are you can there's a book actually called the hp way so if any one of you wants to read it buy it it's really a fascinating read i have it right here next to me and i read it every now and then but there's a couple of things in the book that i really really appreciate one of them is called the open door policy and that means that um there is no real hierarchy in the company. Now think about this. I mean, this is something that we know from companies that are scaling right now, you know, startup companies, or even if you think in Silicon Valley, some of the tech companies, but they're all way younger than HP. Think about somebody coming up with this kind of a principle 60, 70 years ago, okay? And what it meant to me is, I remember as an intern in HP, speaking with executives of HP that were at VP or SVP level, them asking me if I want to come for lunch, um, inviting me to go skiing with them on the weekend. And I was like, this was amazing for me as a German guy. Germany is very hierarchical, at least it was when I grew up there. And then you get into this business culture where you can talk to anyone uh, and you can make suggestions, you can ask questions and uh, you get answers uh, and people spend time with you in one-on-one -on -one settings or in group settings. And I haven't, I haven't found this anywhere else, um, and I I really try and um, I really try and, and foster that uh, with my with my team uh, with my ecosystem also externally. It's one of the reasons why I accepted the invite um, because it's something that I that I like. Uh, the weirdest thing for me in this invite is that you call me by my last name. I'm not used to that anymore. I'm Christoph uh, every day. Okay, in the company to all the employees, the thousands of employees that we have. That's what I like about HP. The fact that we are then a tech company that has a lot of innovation helps, okay? I think it's, it's super cool uh, that there are new products, new value propositions that come out. The 3D printing was one of those. Um, and I think that's super exciting. You know, if, if you have a company that can continuously come up with new ideas and with new portfolio and new, new ways to impress customers, and doing that for 70 years uh, and longer, um, I think that's impressive. So that's what I like about HP. All right, very interesting. So uh, now we will open it up again uh, to the audience. I see we do have a raised hand. So uh, John V, feel free to unmute and ask your question. Hi, thank you for your wonderful presentation. I was just wondering, what are some obstacles that you faced throughout your 20 plus years of professional experience? And what do you believe they taught you to advance both as a person and throughout your career? Yeah, look, obstacles. Um, I mean, look, I, I'm facing an obstacle right now. <laughs> I'm trying to learn Python. Um, and it's uh, it's very different. I mean, I, when, and I'm doing it not because I need it really for my job. I'm doing it because I'm interested in it and I want to understand what some of my engineers are doing. So I'm trying to learn it and it's tough. Huh? It's tough after years of not having to learn a coding language. Uh, you know, when I grew up, the coding language, you probably don't know them, but it was basics and Turbo Pascal and stuff. And then I hadn't done anything for like 20, 25 years. And now I'm looking at this Python thing and it's super interesting, but I'm also, you know, it's like an out of body experience. I'm looking at myself, how slow I am in getting it. And it's, it's super unnerving, but I think, um, any obstacle that I've seen, Janavi, was something, it's like a challenge. It's something that you want to leave behind you, okay? And, and really just, just beat, okay? And that has always been my, my spirit. I look at my job sometimes like I look at a, a sports that I play. There is this, there's a certain winning um, spirit that you need to have. And it, it requires you to motivate yourself. I mean, this this. This example right now with Python, Python is, is really my own motivation. And I think it's important to keep that. I think if I don't have that anymore, I don't think I, I could motivate myself to come to work every day. Uh, so I think it's important that you have that, that grit and that uh, energy uh, and that, that yeah, willingness to, uh, to learn new things. Um, that's how I would answer that question. I hope that makes sense. All right, Arav, uh, I see you've raised your hand, so please feel free to ask your question. Awesome. Yeah, so I'm very intrigued by a lot of the things you mentioned here today, but uh, one thing in particular I wanted to understand more, uh, though this might be slightly redundant, is uh, what made you choose to leave HP and join Philips for uh, leading their lighting business um, after being with HP for so long? Mm -hmm. Very good question. Um, so 
I was very intrigued. Um, I wanted to work for a European company. Uh, that was actually a, uh, it's something I wanted to, to get uh, as an experience. I had until then worked for my dad's company, which was a small family business. Uh, I worked for P&G, uh, based uh, headquartered in Ohio in the US, and then HP headquartered in Palo Alto in California. And when Philips, <clears throat> Philips, I, I got a call from a headhunter and they talked about a European technology company. And I was actually intrigued. Uh, I was like, who? <laughs> okay, nobody came to mind. Uh, and then he, and, and the second or third call, he said, hey, it's Philips. And I thought it was interesting because there's a lot of parallels uh, to HP. Philips is also a company that, you know, is, is quite seasoned. It's a company that um, used to be in three businesses. They had a consumer business, a lighting business, and a big medical business. They've sold the lighting business or actually the lighting business did its own IPO a couple of years ago. Um, but a very well-known brand name, um, in particular in Asia and in, and in Europe, in the US as well. And when I did my first interviews with them, I, I saw a lot of commonality with HP, but I also saw a very European company. And so it has a little bit of a, of a different cultural aspect. Um, it also plans its business quite differently. It's not as short-term. As, as HP is. There's a lot more um, planning in, in a 10-year window. And for me, it was actually very interesting to come back to HP and bring some of these ideas back into HP, okay? So we have a 10-year plan right now as well. And our CEO, Enrique, of course, came up with it. But we talked about it a lot. We talked about the need to have more of a North Star to follow for a longer period of time, not just to be optimized for a year or for a quarter, but have something that you go after and did you really try and change the narrative of the company so it was a very interesting uh, and intentional move uh, and i got what i wanted to get but I also as i said before i missed hp and so went back after just below two years all right so do we have any uh final questions from the audience Anybody? All right, Ishan, I see you raise your hand again, so please feel free to ask your question. Hi, um, thank you so much for your answer to my other question. I actually had a, a kind of a follow-up more specific. So you mentioned kind of how you maintain a sort of network or relationships with other people. And so the, I kind of had a more specific question with regards to that. Um, something that I've read about that a lot of business leaders do is they keep track of lots of different people in their networks, birthdays and other major holidays and write some personalized cards or things like that as a form of maintaining their network. Do you mm -hmm. have to apply any similar strategies as a high level executive at HP um, with your colleagues and with other maybe childhood friends or of sorts to maintain these relationships? Yeah, I do. Um, and it's actually something that has become more and more important to me personally. Um, and it's it's really, it's a mix of, of family friends, private friends, and then a lot of business uh, friends as well, let's call it that. Uh, but it's important to stay in touch with them. It has become so much easier with social media uh, to actually do that. Um, so on the weekend in particular, during the week, it's, it's sometimes a little bit difficult. I mean, I do use, I do use LinkedIn and that's how uh, I think Araf as well got me. He found me on, <laughs> he found me on LinkedIn. I use LinkedIn a lot uh, and I use it, you could say Ishan to, to stay in touch with people, but actually maybe more important to get to know people. Uh, LinkedIn is an important, or social media, let me not just focus on LinkedIn, but social media can be an important sales tool. When you are in a hunting mode, okay, you're trying to win new business, how do you get to know the decision takers? I can give them a call, I can write them an email. Uh, more often than not, they don't pick up or they don't, don't reply. And so when you actually start using social media, to get in touch with them. And very often you don't talk about, hey, do you wanna buy a PC? That's not the first message you send. You talk about something that is authentic to you, but maybe important to them, okay? And so this is actually where data analytics helps, okay? It's all about creating relationships. And so I use LinkedIn for that. And then I think it is very important um, to stay in touch with talent. That's, that's what I would call this. And you can find talent in your professional life, you can find talent in your in your private life. Mixing the two um, is sometimes difficult, but again, social media can actually help you do that. And so to answer your question, yes, I have uh, tons of birthdays uh, that are in my outlook. 
Um, and uh, the first thing I do every day is I check whose birthday is it and I, I make sure I congratulate them. Okay. Sometimes it's a phone call. Sometimes it's a text. Sometimes it's a message on LinkedIn. Okay. But I, I do that. I also believe in mentoring. So I have mentors of my own that I call and ask uh, any, any advice that I need. But I do mentor myself. A lot of a lot of people as well. I actually have no idea how many it is. My assistant told me that maybe we have to stop it because <laughs> it's a lot of time spent. But so it's a, it's a bunch of people. I am also in touch with my soccer buddies. You know the the kids I grew up with. Uh, they are they are all still back home in Germany. But we talk once a month. Uh, it's a group of us. It's important. It's important for my for my balance in life uh, to do that. Um, my two kids, you know, uh, are probably they're a little bit older than you are. They're 18 and 21. Um, they don't like to talk to me on the phone that much. But if I want to get to them, I need to I need to do it via social media. And so uh, I do a lot of that. And, and I think it is it is super important for my private life. But please believe me, it's super important for my business life as well. All right. Very interesting. Yeah, um, so. so uh, anybody else, uh, any other audience questions, feel free to raise your hand. All right, Arav, yeah, feel free to unmute. Sure thing. So uh, I guess slightly off topic, but something I was very curious about is, is I noticed you were fluent in a multitude of languages. I wanted to understand um, how you think this kind of helped you communicate um, going internationally in so many different countries um, to work with so many different people in various uh, uh, ideologies of business. Yeah, look, I actually think if you, this was another thing. I knew that if I wanted for my objective of living in different places and getting to know different cultures, if I wanted that to come true, that speaking languages is probably a very good idea. Um, and, and the reason is that, yes, English works in many, many countries, um, but it's not the same uh, as speaking the local language. And if you really want to win the hearts and minds of people, business-wise or private life, you need to speak the local language. And uh, I, you know, I studied, um, one of my first languages in school was actually Latin. Um, and that's a really cool language, but you don't speak it. <laughs> you translate old text. And I was super bored by that uh, when I went to school. Um, and then I, then I got French and that was, that opened up uh, a lot of horizons. Um, you know, I spent vacations then in France, uh, in France, actually two of the guys that I talked to every month, we did a, a camping trip uh, when I was 16 to France, a very memorable trip. And then I decided at during that trip on a camping ground in, in Paris, I decided I'm going to study in France. Okay. And so I did that. Um, I tried to learn Arabic uh, when I, when I lived in Dubai, I speak a little bit, uh, not, not as well as my French, but enough enough to understand enough to uh to make a comment here or there um and so i i think languages are are really important um because they open up a different insight into a culture into a country that you would not get if you don't speak it so i hope you all speak multiple languages <laughs> All right, so uh, we're just gonna ask any other final questions from the audience. Uh, okay, anybody else? Okay, I see that uh, somebody asked a follow-up here in the chat. And they, they wanna know what is the most important language for business? Python. Right now it's Python for me because <laughs> I'm trying to learn it. <laughs> uh, look, depends what business you're in, depends what country you are in. Uh, if you're in a global role like me, it is English, um, but don't think that you can just get into a global role. So how do you get to the global role? Maybe you have to learn another language before. And I intentionally made that comment about Python um, because I think it's the balance of human interaction and interaction with data that in particular in your guy's career, is going to be very important. Okay, so I, I really want all of you to, to embrace it. You, you grew up in a generation that has embraced social media, that has embraced coding uh, many times over uh, relative to my generation. And not all of you need to become coders or data analysts, but all of you should understand uh, what it requires. I think that is, that is important. That's what I'm telling my own kids as well. So um, 
it's just different. And uh, I think we, you can look as a into a spoken language as a differentiator. You can look into a coding language as a differentiator. If you have maybe both, uh, even better. Whatever works for you guys. Um, but communicating with people and understanding what they want is has always been important and will always be important. The speed at which it moves and evolves is only going to pick up more and more and more. It has picked up so much in the past 30 years since I went to high school. And that's just my advice, uh, communicating and understanding what people want. It's good, it's good to, be, to be in the know and it's good to, to understand how that works. Awesome. So that was a very interesting answer to that question. Um, and we are closing in on time here. So I think we're going to wrap it up. Uh, for, for all of our members, more information about our, our next few events will be provided soon via Slack. Uh, for many of you who are tuning in online and might be interested in becoming a member of IBC, please feel free to check out any of our national chapters uh, at uh, internatus.org slash apply. Uh, I want to take a moment to especially thank Mr. Shell for, for coming and taking this time out of uh, his day to speak for us. Uh, it was uh, very intriguing to learn more about your professional experiences and what you got there, uh, and especially coming from uh, nine different countries and working in so many different places. Um, and so I, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their weekend here, and, and uh, I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you.